time. Okay. Um, are there any other technical instructions? Chat is down below. Uh, and then as Laura said, um, mute is to your left. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, webinar. I am really, really excited about this one. I'm, I'm hoping to learn a lot, as, as I'm sure you are. Um, with that, I'd like to, to introduce Dr. Talia Stroud, who is the director of the Engaging News Project, and she is also an associate professor of Com Studies at UT Austin. Um, she's got a huge, long, illustrious um, resume, so and, and Vita. So I'm not even going to begin to to go into that. I will let her uh, tell you what she wants to tell you about herself, and then we will hear about the best practices for uh, audience engagement in a digital world. Um, with that, Talia, the, the, the screen is yours. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? I see a couple people, so if you're just giving me a head nod, I'll be able to tell. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, um, thank you so much for not reading my CV. Even I can't make it through those things. They're just way too excessive for academics. But uh, what a pleasure to be here. And I'm delighted to share some of the work that we've been doing at the Engaging News Project with you. Um, I am hopeful that as we go throughout this presentation, we'll stop for a few moments to hear thoughts and uh, questions that you might have. So please uh, feel welcome to do that uh, at breaks. Or if, as I'm discussing something, you have a question, don't hesitate to use the chat function or to stop me. Um, I'm really happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. So I'm gonna share my screen here and get a PowerPoint presentation up so that we can use that to guide our discussion today. Can you see that? Okay, excellent. So it turns out that now um, I actually cannot see any of you. I'm gonna e minimize the, uh, the chat screen there, but I have uh, Katie Steiner, who's with the Engaging News Project, who also is here with me, who will let me know if anyone has a question or anything pops up on chat. So please know that those will be available. Okay, so getting started, the Engaging News Project uh, is a research-based organization here at the University of Texas at Austin. And our big goal is how can we help news organizations think about what works for commercial viability and democratic benefit. So how do we help news organizations meet their business and democratic goals? And this whole thing started as a way to uh, work with news organizations and find out what sorts of things the academy could bring to help them. So two pivotal research projects that uh, inspired me to start engaging news project. First, I had written a book called Niche News where I was noting the extent to which partisanship was governing the way in which people interact with news. And it really worried me for the news business in general. And then second, I played a very small role on the Federal Communications Commission project on the information needs of communities. And as part of that, really came to appreciate the really challenging business time that news organizations are facing. And so I thought to myself, um, academia has uh, some resources. We have uh, time, we have amazing students, and we have research techniques. Are there ways that we can leverage these three things to help news organizations? And so that's the entire impetus for the project that I'll be discussing today. Um, I'm tremendously grateful for a number of funders that have sponsored our work. You see their logos included below. Uh, and this is made possible through grant funding from these organizations. So what do we do? Well, first, we're an academic organization. We're located at the University of Texas at Austin, and we have um, a staff of researchers. So we have faculty at a number of different institutions across the U.S. that are affiliated with the Engaging News Project, and we're recently um, adding some folks internationally, which is really exciting to me. Uh, we also have uh, graduate students and undergraduate students that participate as part of the Engaging News Project and help us with our research. Uh, we have a couple of programmers that also assist us with some of the technical side of things. And all of us come together to share this mission of thinking about how we can use social scientific research methods in service of the news industry. So how we do this is we partner with news organizations on research. And this happens in a number of different ways. Um, sometimes a news organization has an idea and they contact us and say, hey, we've been curious about uh, some topic what do you think about this? And we devise a research project in collaboration. Other times we have a research idea and reach out to news organizations to ask them if they'd be interested in participating. 
And what we do is we offer the tools that we come up with. So as you'll see throughout this presentation, we've developed a few tools and we offer our findings uh, for free via our website and social media. And what we hope Engaging News Project becomes more and more is a resource for news organizations that are interested in thinking about engagement and using research methods to find out what actually works and what doesn't given the objectives that you lay out in advance. So that's basically where we're coming from. And what I'm hoping to do today is to tick through a bunch of different uh, uh, subsections of the Engaging News Project and share with you research we've done within each of these different sections. Uh, so before I get started, anyone have any questions about Engaging News Project itself or what we're doing or our mission or anything along those lines? Okay, I'm going to take that as we are all on the same page and plow ahead. Okay, so comment sections. Um, this has been an incredibly interesting place to do research because there are a number, a number of components of comment sections that make them high stakes for newsrooms. Um, the first is that research suggests that comments can affect what people think about your journalism. So how people conceive of your news brand, for instance, can be affected by the tenor of the comments that are left uh, on the site. And then second, and I think quite challenging uh, from a normative or a democratic standpoint, is that research shows that incivility in the comments can affect what people take away from your journalism. So if you have an article and there are uncivil comments beneath the article, people can come away with really polarized views of the topic that you're discussing. And if that incivility weren't there, they don't have the same level of polarization. So there's something about incivility in the comment section that can affect people's attitudes and the democracy thinking about it more broadly. Um, even beyond that, incivility really affects whether people are willing to comment in the first place. So a highly uncivil comment space can reduce the probability that a wide variety of people participate in the comment section. So these are kind of some of the potential negatives from a comment section, but there are really positive things that can come from having comment sections. The whole reason for including them in the first place is let's finally have a space in which the audience can engage with the news organization, in which commenters can engage with one another. And you can see the development of communities in some of these comment sections where people are routinely exchanging views with one another and are learning more about uh, people that live in their area. So there's a great potential benefit from comment sections. And finally, comment sections, uh, depending on the platform used, can be a source of revenue. So some news organizations that we've worked with, uh, some of the bigger ones, in fact, are generating six figures in terms of revenue on the basis of using particular platforms and not others. So I think comment sections are really worth our time. Now, they're by no means the only way in which you can engage uh, with an audience. There are many other ways to do this. But if we think about a true space in which journalists and communities can come together and exchange ideas, I think that this, this has a lot of potential because of how common comment sections are. So looking at comment sections, one thing that um, often crops up when people think about them is how civil or uncivil the space is. So as the Engaging News Project, we collaborated with 20 different news organizations across the United States. And this was everyone from very large sites like the Washington Post, to smaller sites that are more, uh, more geographically uh, isolated. So like the Civil Beat in Hawaii or Willamette Week uh, uh, out of Willamette in Oregon. And so with each of these news sites, we collaborated with them to send out a survey on their sites to their commenters to ask their commenters what they thought about the space. And for us, this was really valuable to find out what sort of variability we saw across all of these sites. And for each of the news organizations that were involved, we actually created a customized report for them about what their commenters were thinking, who their commenters were, how they interacted with the content on the site, and what they would like to see improved. So here I'm showing you the aggregate results across all 20 of the sites. And this first chart was one of the, one of the charts that I found to be most surprising. Because I think a lot of times we think about comment sections as being these terrible places where you're not getting a lot of civil conversations. But if we actually look at what the commenters think, there's a great deal of variability. So as you see here at one large site, only around 15% of people on that site thought that the comments were very or somewhat civil. Contrast that with some of these small sites where in excess of 75% of commenters thought that the site had comments that were very or somewhat civil. So the question becomes, what is it that differentiates all of these sites from one another and determines whether that comment space is civil or not? Well, there are a couple of things that we've learned. 
One is uh, when sites are smaller or when the sites are creating smaller communities that allow people a space to get to know the other commenters, they're creating a more civil space. And you see that play out even in this chart just slightly because the smaller sites tend to be slightly more civil than the larger sites. There are some differences uh, by platform. So some platforms seem to generate more civil perceptions compared to others, but it's by no means universal. And um, uh, I have plenty more to say as we continue out this, throughout this conversation. Um, some have investigated whether the comments are more civil on platforms like Facebook in comparison to others. And there is some suggestion that when the comments uh, ask you to leave a real name as opposed to being anonymous, the space is more civil, but it's by no means a cure-all. Even on Facebook, and I'm sure we've all seen this, people will indicate or people will comment in very uncivil ways. So platform is not the solution overall. Um, great question that Katie just shared with me. How are we defining small, medium, and large? Uh, the way in which we did this for this study was we looked at their rankings on Alexa, which monitors how, uh, how many uh, hits they're getting on average from their panel. And so small sites, I don't have the exact number here, but we divided them into, we divided them on the basis of uh, how, of their ranking on Alexa. Um, and small sites were sites like Civil Beat, large sites were sites like Washington Post. And medium sites, I'm trying to bring to mind one example of what a medium site would be. They were more regionally focused ones. Um, I think uh, Philly or AL.com were ones that were more toward the large and middle large um, sorts of sites. So that's how we did it. It was based on traffic to their actual site. And I see another uh, comment here, which is wonderful. Thank you so much for using the comments space. Um, looks like Ken Martin had to move all comments to Facebook because of being besieged by spam. Please address uh, Facebook comment versus the Austin Bulldog site itself. Um, yeah, would love to hear more about um, your experience there and uh, how these different platforms play out, but certainly uh, having the time and resources dedicated to moderation, if you're seeing a lot of spam or a lot of incivility, I think that's a primary reason that people are selecting different platforms, so that completely makes sense. Okay, so despite the fact that there is concern about spam and concern about civility, um, research suggests that a lot of places still have comment se sections. Uh, and this is also in spite of the fact that we've had several very high profile instances in which uh, comment sections have been removed. So we did an analysis of 125 different news websites. So we actually went to all of these websites and had this very lengthy coding scheme when we looked at them. And nearly all the sites, there was a comment section. Um, the Associated Press media editors did a survey and a significant chunk of news organizations indicated that they uh, were likely to continue including comments on their site. So uh, despite the fact that it might seem as though this is a, a, a dying space in some way, it's because of these high profile instances, we find significant indications that people are continuing to have comment sections on their sites. So, but we also did a survey, and this was a national probability survey where we asked people whether or not they had commented on news in the past. And uh, I, I, I believe that this is one of the uh, most sophisticated surveys that has been done on news commenters to date. And what we found from our survey were that 14% had commented on news at some point in the past. And then a sizable chunk, 35%, said that they read but did not post comments on news sites. So there's an audience here that you may not even realize is actually consuming commenting uh, on a site, but they actually don't participate themselves. And then 51% had neither read nor posted comments on news. But if we think of the nation by and large, if half of, uh, if half of, uh, if half of uh, US citizens are participating in some way in the comment section, this is a pretty substantial, uh, a pretty substantial group. Okay, so the next thing we did on our survey was asking people what sorts of things they would like to see in comment sections. And this result to me was very striking. And it was striking because of the consistency across all of these different sites. So it didn't matter whether your site was large or small or medium sized. It didn't matter what sort of platform you used. It didn't matter geographically where you were across the US. Overwhelmingly, majorities, uh, more than majorities, so 70% or more, indicated that they wanted journalists to be in the comment section to clarify factual questions. 
Now, it wasn't the case that people wanted journalists to be involved in other ways. So we asked them other ways in which journalists could get involved. So would you want journalists to direct the conversation or would you want journalists to just include their views? That's not the case. What people really wanted was journalists clarifying these factual questions. We also asked people whether they would want experts to respond to comments by news site. And again, overwhelmingly, people wanted experts involved in the comment section. So when we're thinking about audience engagement, I think that there's a clear desire expressed by commenters themselves across all of these sites that one way to engage audiences using a, a technology that many news organizations already have in place is just to answer these factual questions or figure out ways to get experts involved in this space. And this, I think, is the really key part of what we think about audience engagement. It's creating a space in which members of the community and those that might be sources for news organizations or the journalists themselves are able to interact with one another. And this can be a really, a really beneficial thing, not only for audiences, but also for journalists, because they can learn more about their audience, what their audience might want, what questions they might happen to have, and find ideas for future stories. So we also wanted to um, test this in some way. And so what we did, and this is, I think, uh, uh, another key way in which the Engaging News Project has worked with news organizations in the past. So the slides to this point show how we've collaborated in terms of doing surveys with audience members. And this was one where we actually did a study to find out what's the kind of causal relationship between having someone involved in the comment section and um, seeing what the outcome of that might be. So we partnered with a local news station and across 70 different political posts, we randomized whether the reporter um, went on to the, onto, and this was on Facebook, I should know, whether the reporter went into Facebook and chatted with the folks that were leaving comments, whether the station went in and chatted with people who were leaving comments, or whether there was no engagement whatsoever. So the station and the reporter did not get involved. And when the reporter and the station were involved in the comment space, they weren't leaving tons and tons of comments. This would be on, on average three or four comments left in the space. And when they were getting involved, they weren't going in there to reprimand people for bad behavior. They weren't getting involved in any way um, infringing upon their journalistic objectivity. They were going in there in order to generate conversation, to respectfully highlight strong comments, to answer questions. Uh, to add details about the story that they weren't able to include in the story itself. So uh, on a couple of instances, um, the reporter went in and said, here's the actual text of the bill and included a link to the bill itself. And what we found from this study, um, so we compared what happens when the reporter engages, what happens when the station engagement, and what happens when there's no engagement. And what we found is that when the reporter got involved in the comment section, incivility reduced by about 15%. And the provision of evidence, by which we mean, did the commenters include any evidence whatsoever for their claims? So we, weren't, we, we didn't have a high bar in terms of what evidence meant. Nonetheless, when the reporter was engaged, the provision of evidence increased by about 15%. And it's really important to the study to note that this only happened when the reporter was getting involved. We did not see the same patterns when the station got involved. And we think that this is key. Now, from the study, I can't be sure why this happened. But my explanation would be that the reporter is someone that the audience actually really wants to get to know. This is a person that they can identify with. And that makes it more likely to have these positive benefits accruing from being involved in the comment space. The other thing I want to make sure to know is this was not a cure-all. So reporter engagement reduced incivility, but it didn't cure it. It wasn't as though the reporter got involved and those people that were leaving uncivil comments left. And I think that what this suggests is when we think about instances like the comment section or any, any moment in which we're thinking about generating productive audience engagement, it's a whole series of different things that a newsroom does to create a productive environment. There's not one cure-all to make it a, a, a wonderful strategy. You have to think about what those different elements are. And what I think the Engaging News Project is able to do is to really illuminate what the effect is. So what's the appropriate constellation of techniques in order to generate the most productive space we can when thinking about audience engagement? So another project that we did is we worked with the New York Times and they um, gave us access to 9 million of their comments. So this was a, a, a huge data set for us. And we were really interested to learn from all of these comments across many years, 
what happens in the space when uh, the Times changes the design, for example, or when people are rewarded for good behavior in the comment section? And we learned a lot. So the first is the design of the comment section really affects how people behave. As a very minor example of that, uh, we noticed that prior to a major redesign in 2011, more people were using abuse flags in the comment section of the New York Times compared to after this redesign. And we thought this was really perplexing. So we looked, was it the case for redesign? And that wasn't the case. Comments were pretty much equal in terms of their level of incivility. So why was it that the abuse flag was being used so, so infrequently after the redesign compared to before? And what we found is that the redesign actually made the abuse flag more challenging for people to find. So this is a, a small example of how the design of the comment section really influences how people behave. And I'll show you another study in just a few minutes that I think uh, exemplifies this in another way. The other thing we wanted to know is what happens when commenters are rewarded for good behavior. And the way in which the New York Times does this is by selecting comments as being a New York Times pick. Um, and these are highlighted as their, uh, their really strong comments. They try to look for a diversity of viewpoints and really well-written comments uh, to give this designation. Uh, and the other way in which comments can be rewarded is by other users in the community. So they give rewards by the number of recommendations that a comment receives. So newsroom can give rewards by designating a New York Times pick. Audiences can give rewards by uh, pressing recommend next to the comment. And what we found is that when a commenter received one of these rewards, when you left a comment and you got a lot of recommendations or you were designated as a New York Times pick, it increased the number of comments that that person left in the 30 days after leaving the comment compared to the 30 days before. So if one of the ideals of a comment section is to increase the good behavior by people who are leaving really excellent comments, we think that this strategy of highlighting strong comments might be a promising one because as those people are leaving more comments afterward, they're leaving more of these great comments. So you're rewarding the people that are doing a good job in the comment space and then boosting the amount of time that they comment. In addition, although we didn't analyze it here, you're also sending a cue to the rest of the commenters. This is the sort of comment that we see as being, uh, as being, really beneficial as being one that we're, we're highlighting. And a lot of different platforms out there uh, allow you to highlight comments. So giving people a featured commenter designation or um, appending a particular post to the top of the comment st commenting stream. So this is possible in a lot of different uh, platforms. The other thing we wanted to know, and this one I think is one that's disturbing that we need to think more about, is what generates a lot of user recommendations? Is um, including recommendations on a site sending a positive cue to encourage good behavior? And what we found from the New York Times comments is if you really want to generate a lot of recommendations on your comment, you should include both partisan terms and uncivil terms. So calling out Republicans or Democrats in some way indicating that uh, they've done something bad, that they're a liar, you, the use of uh, those sorts of terms increase the number of recommendations. And I think that this is really worrisome because in a commenting space, this isn't exactly what you'd want to reward and so I think more thought needs to be put into how do recommendations play out in commenting spaces? And I'll share a study with you in another few moments that I think begins to address this. So these are the sum of the things that we've learned from comment sections. And before I continue on with the next section, I would like to open it up for just a few minutes because it certainly wouldn't be a good presentation and certainly not engaging if we didn't have a little bit of time um, to hear from you. So I'd be curious to hear any questions you might have for me, but also just a moment of sharing among those folks who are, who are part of this webinar, what things have you done in the comment section that you think have worked well? Or do you have questions? Are there things that you wish you would try and want to know whether it would work or not? I see, um, well, we had one question here noting how comments can be a revenue source. Um, so there are particular platforms, Discuss being one of them, that um, include ads as part of the commenting software and then pay the news organization a component of that ad revenue uh, it, it, for having that platform there. So it is a direct revenue line. Um, I think that there are softer ways to think of comment sections as revenue generators. So uh, in some analyses, we found that commenters are those that are most loyal to the site. 
they're your return visitors, they're those that are more likely to be subscribers or members, depending on how you, depending on how you cash that out. And so I think that you could think of the comment section as a place to cultivate and as a, as a source of revenue because it's a way in which you generate this enthusiasm for your news organization. I'm peeking here at additional questions. And this question, um, if you're not on the chat, this question is, do you know whether your findings about the engagement of journalists as a driver of civility replicated on, or can be replicated on social media? Um, the, the study that we did was on Facebook, so it was on a social media platform. It was the news organization's page. Um, I would love to replicate this more in other sorts of venues. So could this be done on Twitter, for instance? Would love to see that done. I have not seen that done um, thus far. There was one other study that's been done that replicated it by looking at um, news organizations' websites. And they found exactly what we found, that when news organizations were involved on their comment sections on their websites, the comments were less hostile was how that, um, that researcher defined it. And there were more comments left as a consequence. So that has been replicated at least offline. Okay, another question here. Um, have you talked about removing comments? Are there best practices for simple moderating? Uh, we haven't talked about um, best practices for removing comments and would certainly welcome others to weigh in on chat or if you want to uh, unmute and weigh in, that's also great. Um, I think that strategies for removing comments, in general, I think news organizations that are doing lots of moderation like the New York Times are removing comments and they're doing so for very clear criteria. And I think that that's really the magic of removing comments is being completely upfront with people these are the criteria. This is the reason that we have removed your comments. And if you're communicating with your commenters to basically you're teaching them in a sense, this is the standard here and this is why this violates uh, our community standards. I think that you can remove comments and keep it a productive space by explaining to people what you're doing. Um, another oh, a comment here that JJIE and Youth Today does the pick posting comments as a quote graphic. Facebook and Twitter pics are shared on both platforms. Really fantastic. Um, I'll have to look into that. That's great. And thank you for sharing that. Um, have you seen the outside your bubble comment section on Facebook? It doesn't really accept comments in the traditional sense, but highlights comments from other platforms as well as emphasizes differing opinions. I think that is just so exciting as a way to think about comments and as a way to do it outside of the box. And I think that just exactly that sort of experimentation is really what news organizations need to be doing in this comment space because we know that the current version isn't always working. So thinking about these great new ways to do it is, I applaud it so much. Um, and I will also say that um, the Engaging News Project is really um, eager to partner with organizations that are doing this to evaluate it. Because if you just throw it out there, and you just see if people are using it, you may not know, is that actually having an effect on people's attitudes on what they think of the new site? And if you don't know that, it's worrisome if, what if this is actually having a, a bad effect? So we're really eager to partner with news organizations that have these innovative ideas to really test what effect they might happen to have. Um, are you aware of any comment systems that allow commenters to get abuse flags or guidance on whether their comments will meet publication guidelines as they write them and before they submit. Um, there are some news organizations where um, there's a new commenting platform called Civil Comments. And the way that Civil Comments works is before your, before your comment uh, is permitted, you are essentially rating a couple of other comments in the community. And you're determining as a community what comments get put on the site and what comments don't. So I think that that's one mechanism uh, by which this can be done. Um, I, I would applaud a site that would want to try something where uh, maybe using some sort of machine learning, it's giving you a score on your comments and saying something like, the comment isn't, uh, your comment's rating a, you know 57% on our civility scale. Do, do you wanna reconsider how you're phrasing that? I think that would be really interesting to do and I haven't seen something like that in practice, although I've heard it that pitch, so that is not uniquely my idea. I know others have had that idea as well. Okay, thank you for that. I'm so glad that the chat is working well and encourage you to keep doing that as we're going throughout this. Okay, so the next section is on engagement buttons and I think that this section starts to answer some of the questions I raised a moment ago about including recommend as a button and some of the problematic aspects of recommend. 
So first, social media buttons are present on news websites. It's nearly universal that there are links to Facebook and Twitter, and most have some sort of other button on their site as well. We found this across all different types of television and newspaper sites. Um, there also, for many comment sections, um, there's a provision that allows you to interact with other commenters. So whether this is replying to them or recommending their comments or liking the comments, this is really common. And what we wanted to do is test how people react to different buttons. And here's why we did it. When you look at comment sections, particularly Facebook, you see this like button. And other news organizations have, or other commenting platforms, I should say, have adopted really similar sorts of upvoting. So whether it's a, an upward uh, triangle there or the like button, there's something to indicate that you are expressing some form of positive feedback on that comment. But the thing that really got us thinking is like seems to indicate agreement. And in a partisan world, are we really wanting to give people buttons that get them to respond to comments through a partisan lens, thinking I like this or I don't like this, I agree with this or I don't agree with this. And so we did a test where we compared what happens in a comment section if you include a like button, a recommend button, or our innovation is a respect button. And so we did an experimental study where we gave people identical comment sections. The only thing we varied is whether the button text said like, recommend, or respect. And what we found is that respect either had a similar, people behaved similarly with respect as they did with like, or in several instances, we found that with respect, Democrats and Republicans were more likely to click respect on a comment from the other side of the aisle than they were to click like. So essentially, respect allowed people to provide positive feedback to comments on the other side of the political aisle. And we found this to be really encouraging because it suggests that these subtle indications within a comment section can lead people to respond and behave very differently. Democrats can respect a Republican, a Republican comment that they wouldn't like, and vice versa for Republicans. Um, so uh, the, we also looked at recommend as part of this research. And recommend sometimes behaved as, uh, as like did and sometimes as respected. So it didn't seem to be as clear as the benefits we saw of including respect. And so as a consequence of this research, um, a couple of organizations have actually adopted a respect button as part of their comment section. Uh, the Texas Tribune here in Austin, their Trib Talk opinion site um, uh, included this. And I see a comment here um, from David. Did you give readers a choice of like and respect or just use one or the other? In the study, we just used one or the other. So we either gave them like or respect. And that's where we found the benefits of including this respect button. So um, not every organization has the opportunity to go in and change the text of these buttons. And for, uh, for um, platforms like Facebook, it's challenging to think that they might do so. But for those that have platforms that they've designed themselves, we really urge a consideration of more diverse feedback mechanisms like respect. And I think that organizations like Discuss really should be considering these sorts of strategies. As a consequence of this, we've also developed an engaging buttons plugin. And this is free to use on your site. It actually is at the article level rather than the comment level, but it gives people a different way to respond to your content. And it also gives you, based on our plugin, the backend analytics of how many people are clicking these buttons. So that's one thing that we offer on our site. So that's just a little bit of the research that we've done on uh, engagement buttons. I'll pause for a second to see if anyone has any questions or any comments on ways in which they've creatively used uh, things like uh, uh, comment section engagement buttons or anything that they, they uh, might want to share about this. Um, question about the engaging buttons plugin. Yes, it's for the article, not for the comment section itself. Um, for the comment section itself, if you ever had an interest in doing this, we have developed one uh, on WordPress and would be delighted to share that for you. We don't have that available for free on our site, but happy to share any of that code with you if you're interested. Uh, but the, oh, the one that is freely available is for the article level. Okay, any other questions or comments on this?
Okay, we'll go next to online polls and quizzes. And this is another really interesting way in which you can engage with audiences and a relatively simple one for many news organizations. So first we looked at how often are polls being used on news sites and found that the practice is relatively common, um, particularly for local newspapers of the 125 randomly selected that we um, analyzed across these spaces, 57% were using a poll. Now, polls have a lot of benefits. They uh, typically increase time on page, they typically increase page views, and so for that reason, they're quite desirable. But I have to say that I am incredibly concerned about the use of polls on new sites, and here's why I say that. When people click on a poll on a new site, typically it then gives them the distribution of opinions afterwards. So it says, you know, 40% of users agree that this new provision should be adopted by the city council and 60% disagree or something like that. And I'm very concerned about news organizations using polls because this is not a representative sample. It's just the subset of people that happened to go to your site and decided to participate in this poll which as a news organization, thinking about a democratic or a journalistic role is really worrisome because in the worst case scenario, a news organization could actually be misinforming the public about the distribution of opinion by including a non-representative poll on the site. Now, yes, you can include statements like, this is just for fun or this is not representative, but this is still a news organization endorsing this on their site and including it for people to participate in. So I, uh, when I saw this happening, I became concerned. There is academic research suggesting that when people see poll results, it changes their opinions. So if you see a poll on a site that says most people agree with position X, it increases the chances that you will then endorse position X, which is really just to me quite, quite problematic for news organizations to be doing this. And so uh, the Engaging News Project team thought, how could we re-envision polls and get some of the same benefits of engagement, of having people participate in something on the site without this potential grave downside of misinforming people? Um, and before I get to that, I should add one more thing, which is I have had students that actually part of their job is to find any forum on a news site or any forum on a public site that they could game on behalf of a campaign or a candidate which means that organizations other than the news know that these are potentially powerful and are trying to use them to their advantage. Again, something that a news organization would not want to do. Okay, so what can you do instead? And one thing that we decided to investigate was, what if you do a quiz on the site instead? Now, in our research, we didn't, we didn't compare head-to-head -head a poll versus a quiz simply because of the reasons that I've articulated. I think that a poll has a lot of problems for a news organization. A quiz, however, does not. It is absolutely on mission for a news organization to include a fun interactive quiz on their site. And so what we did is we tested what happens if you include just the text of some sort of uh, fact that you might want people to know. So you see the text here, approximately 38% of Americans, et cetera. And what happens if we compare this just textual format to quizzes included on a site? And we used two different types of quizzes in the initial study that we did on this. One was a slider quiz where you can move this bar across and make a guess anywhere from zero to 100% to answer this question. And then the other quiz that we tested was just this standard multiple choice quiz that you see here. So we first did a test experimentally where we randomly assigned people to see one of these three versions and participate in a quiz or read the text. And what we found from this study I think is really telling. So we found that when we included these interactive quiz formats, people spent more time with the information than just the textual presentation of the information. So increasing time with the quizzes. The second thing we found is that people learned more and learned better when they had these interactive quizzes in comparison to just the straight textual information. So both from a business perspective, increasing time on page and people's engagement, and from a democratic perspective, people learning the information, we saw real benefits to including a quiz on a site. Um, after this, we partnered with a news organization where we randomly included quizzes on pages, and we found that a combination of both these multiple choice quizzes and these slider quizzes, which is what we call the one where you can slide the button, increase the time that people spent on the page on an actual news site. So based on all of this research, we said, you know what, we think there's something here. We think quizzes have democratic 
and business benefits. Let's do something with this. And so we actually developed a create a quiz tool that's undergone a few iterations as we've continually updated this tool to be more modern in the presentation style of, of, of uh, presenting this information. It's completely free. Um, you can use it on your site. To date, 50, around 50 news organizations have used this on their sites. Um, and it's uh, one that we think is, is really useful. Of course, we're not the only ones doing quizzes and there are many other uh, projects out there. So I, I'm not solely endorsing this one, but in general, I'm endorsing this idea of including a quiz that provides people with the correct information after they give a guess. Um, the other thing that I will say about the quiz tool that we've created, it gives you a lot of backend analytics. So after people participate, you as the news organization can go in and find out what were the wrong answers that were common among our, uh, among our audience. And uh, a few news organizations that have used this have then used that to generate story ideas because they see, oh wow, a lot of our folks have been misinformed about this particular issue. They think the crime rate is lower than it actually is, or um, they think that more people have a concealed carry permit than they actually do. And then they do a story saying, hey, we did this quiz, here's what we learned, and here's the correct information. So this, is, as a mechanism for audience engagement, not only has these business and democratic benefits, but it also then in turn can benefit the newsroom by showing new ways of uh, creating stories that respond to the information that your audience already holds. So this is our quiz tool. Um, a couple of tips. So. Uh, sometimes it's challenging when you first do this to think, okay, so what exactly should I ask in a quiz? And so here are just a couple of possible candidates for developing a quiz. Um, you can ask people uh, what percentage of the public does something or has something or what their attitudes are. So anytime you see any form of poll results, these can be great candidates for a quiz. Um, health data, another great source for quiz information any form of government information or crime statistics, and finally, public action. So asking people about voting rates uh, prior to, to or after an election can be an important uh, place to look for quiz information. So all of these are potential candidates for quizzes. So I'll stop here again um, and invite any of your feedback or thoughts in terms of using quizzes or experiences that you've also had using polls or other types of interactive tools on your sites. Would love to hear your experience, questions, ideas. And no obligation to do so if you think, no, we got it. Okay. Oh, I hear someone. I thought. I was just going to encourage everyone to unmute themselves if they want to ask a question with their voice. The mute buttons are just in the lower left corner of your screen. Excellent, thanks for that. And um, I keep looking to my right here because I'm actually joined by Katie Steiner, who's the communication associate for the Engaging News Project, who is uh, helpfully monitoring the, uh, the comment queue. So if you have anything that you're typing in the chat box, we're happy to, happy to take those too. Okay, I will keep going. Another place that Engaging News Project has done research is looking at design and Engagement, engagement can be thought of in so many different ways, and I'm uh, already in this presentation, you've seen a bunch of different ways that you can define engagement. So it could be um, giving commenters a space to talk amongst themselves, so creating a community for users in and of the, their own, uh, to develop their own sort of community. It could be a way of creating a re relationship between the journalists and the commenters, so having journalists actually get involved in the comment section. It can be providing, um, providing your, uh, your audience with a, a way to be engaged with the information that you're sharing, like a quiz tool. And then here, I think, is another way of thinking about engagement, um, which is looking at engagement as how do, you, how do you put things together on your page? How do you design the page in order to maximize the chances that people are clicking on different areas, that they're finding the information that's of interest to them, that they're really substantively interested in what's happening on the site? So this is where we've done some research on design. So the first type of design that we've looked at, and I'll add the substantial caveat at the beginning of this one, that we're not done with this research. So this research needs more refinement, but we were really interested in looking at how does the comment, how is the comment section actually laid out? How is it designed and does that affect the way that people engage? And so we contrasted a comment section that's pretty much the norm on most news sites, which is just one column of comments, one right after another, with a comment section that actually had 
three different columns. And when people left a comment, they were asked to categorize it as either supporting a particular issue, opposing it, or something in the middle, which is uh, raising questions or people who are more ha didn't have a clear position on the issue. And when we contrasted these two different comment sections with one another, we found that people were more likely to leave comments in this three column comment section than they were in the one column comment section. We also found that the comments in this three column space were more substantive and deliberative. So they contained more relevance, they were more um, civil to one another, they were more considerate of different perspectives in comparison to the one column comment structure. Now I said at the beginning that this research is not done and I'll tell you why because I so invite your thoughts on this. When we did this, we found that in the three column comment structure, uh, the dreaded right rail problem appeared for us as it does for many news organizations, which is to say that the rightmost column yielded far fewer level, a, a, a reduced level of engagement in comparison to when it was part of the single, uh, the single stream of comments. So this, there's a design issue here that we need to think through more, which is how do we avoid this right rail problem where the third most column doesn't get the same level of engagement. So more research needs to be done, but I think what the big takeaway of this is, is not only have we found in this stuff that I just chatted about that single words can make a difference, but the layout really can matter for whether you're inviting people to get involved or not. And one of the reasons that I think that this space worked particularly well, well, this three column structure worked well for getting people involved, is it told them what to do in the comment section. So when news organizations originally rolled out comment sections, it was in many instances a free for all, you know, just leave your comments here. Audiences weren't instructed on how to behave in this space. And so I think that strategies of telling them, you know, here's a way in which we would like to see your comments. This is telling them we want to see whether you support or oppose an issue. I think that that is really productive and gives people a reason to comment there. So another way to take this that could inspire audience engagement that we haven't really done a thorough test of, so if anyone is interested on this call, please let me know, would be asking commenters questions or directing them somehow what you're looking for in the comment space. So it might be something like, um, what would you tell Donald Trump in advance of his conversations with China? Or what would you uh, suggest to city council to take up next? Maybe asking these questions gets more people involved in the comment section because it gives them a direction. It shows what the newsroom wants to learn from this space. And so I think that that's something to really think about moving forward that's inspired by this research. The next type of design that we've analyzed is how is the homepage laid out? And we tested two different homepage designs. The first one you can see there on the left is more of a traditional newsprint design. It's more of a classic look, so um, something akin to how the New York Times might be laid out. And we contrasted that with a more contemporary design, as you see there on the right, where um, it's more modular, there are more images, and there's less text on the page. Um, we did a hover over lead here. That's not necessarily recommended practice um, for mobile designs, but there are other ways in which you could uh, include the lead uh, other than hover over. You could uh, include an expanding uh, part where the lead pops up. So just noting that as a caveat for how the design works. But nonetheless, we compare this more traditional design to this more classic or contemporary design, or to this more contemporary design to find out what happened. And when we first did this study, uh, the graduate student that was working on this project came back to me and showed me the results. And my first reaction was, oh my gosh, something is wrong. There's no way that the effect was that large. Go back, check everything, reanalyze the data, test everything again, no way. And he came back and said, no, we found the same results. And I said, okay, we've got to run this study. Let's tweak a few things. We've got to run this again. And we ended up running this study three times because the results, making modifications each time, but we ended up doing that because I was so unconvinced that the results could be that significant. And I, I have tested it now enough that I think that it actually is the case. So what we were seeing are page view increases of 90% of 100% increases in the number of page views on this more contemporary site in, compar in comparison to this more classic site. So uh, on the business side of things, and when I say business, um, I should add that business could be thought of as, oh, that only applies to the commercial press or those that are seeking profits. 
But when I say business, what I really mean are people engaging with the content. More clicks on content is not something that only pertains to the commercial press. Even organizations that are completely not for profit still want people to engage with their, with their information, whether clicking on it or spending time with it. So I just wanted to add that as a substantial caveat. Um, so what we found is this more contemporary layout yielded a tremendous increase in the number of uh, pages that people were clicking on. The other thing we found on the democratic side of things is people learned more from this more contemporary layout than they did from this more classic layout. So on both business and democratic grounds, there was something about this more modern layout that inspired more engagement. Now, the three studies that we did were all confined to the lab. So these were people who we solicited online and asked them to take part in this research project in exchange for paying them a little bit. And there's a potential concern with this. Maybe there's something unique about these people. Maybe it's not something that's realistic. So since we've done this, and I'm now sharing um, research with you that we have not yet published on our website, so you're getting a scoop now. Um, and that is we collaborated with two very large news organizations that were undergoing a redesign on their homepage. And with these news organizations, we did a study using the same technique that we had used in the lab at exactly the same time that one of these news organizations was A-B testing the site on, uh, on their actual audience. And for the other one, we looked at a pre-post. So what happened before and after they launched their redesign compared to what we learned from our lab. And for both of these studies, we found that the results that we saw in the lab were almost identical to those that the news organization was seeing live on their site. So we think that by doing these sorts of analyses, just using participants who are paid to look at these different versions, actually gives a very meaningful indicator of what would happen if the news organization actually launched this redesign. And the other reason that I mentioned this is what we found in doing this work is that lots of news organizations are undergoing redesigns. Some are con continuously redesigning their site. But sometimes what's happening is that lots of money is being dumped into a redesign with very minimal testing taking place. So maybe they're doing some usability testing where they're looking at, uh, you know, maybe 20 people and asking them to browse the site and give them feedback. And then they're moving forward. I think that this is a very risky proposition. If you are undergoing a major redesign on your homepage, you should be working with someone like the Engaging News Project to try to figure out what is the effect of doing this redesign and actually A-B test it in the way in which we did this beforehand with our two large news organizations with, whom we, with which we collaborated to test this live. One of them saw a huge benefit to their redesign. So they saw increases in page views, they saw increases in time on page, the other one did not. And these were very expensive redesigns. And so doing this sort of testing at the front end, using very minimally constructed sites, and a news organization technically could do this on their own. You don't need engaging news project at all. You can do this yourself. It's not that expensive to do. Um, if you're talking about a major redesign that's in the uh, six figure range, the five figure range, this is very, very minimal in terms of a dollar amount. You can do something like this for less than $10,000 test it out to find out how people are responding to the site and whether it's actually going to have the effects that you want by randomly assigning some people to look at the old site and some people to look at the new site. So I'm happy to chat with anyone that's doing a redesign for more details on this, uh, whether we're happy to help you in terms of thinking through this or just sharing what we did so you can do it on your own. I really think that this is best practice. And the, the other takeaway from this is how much homepage design matters for what people learn and what people click on. So those are our um, thoughts on design. Opening it up now, and I see that there are some questions and thoughts. Um, wonder if you have a measure of the age ranges for the design test text versus the visual and modular. Um, really great question. So on this, I'm assuming that you're talking about this homepage one right here. Um, and we did ask people from a wide variety of ages to look at the site and we analyzed whether the results differed for those people who were older and those people who were younger. And we did not find any evidence of any age difference across our three different studies. So I don't think that the preferences and the benefits of the more modern design were only among those who were younger, for instance. Um, so that was, we looked both at age and as education as possible factors that might affect the way people looked at these sites, neither mattered. And when we did this analysis um, with the large news organizations on their sites, 
Um, we also looked at whether it mattered for whether people had been to that site before. So was there something about the change that made them reluctant to like the newer one and didn't find that either. Okay, I see another one here. Site stickiness, any research on design methods on the article level that keep people going to more articles. Um, this is just precisely what we want to do next as part of the Engaging News Project. So if any of you are interested in doing some um, research looking at how the article page is structured, um, please get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to chat more with you about it. The thing that I'm really interested in on, uh, on those sites is um, where are the recommended links? What are the recommended links? And does that affect whether people will click even one more, uh, one more time uh, to the next page on the site? Um, there is one study that we're working on right now. It's a very long-term study, so we won't have results anytime soon. But we gathered browsing data for a thousand different people across a two-week time span. And what we're doing is we're looking at when did those people go to news sites? And of those that went to news sites, what factors contributed to them going to two pages on a news site versus just going once and leaving the site altogether? So I think we will have some answers from that data set, but it's a long-term project. You can imagine how much data we're talking about when I tell you we have all of the individual level pages for a thousand people across a period of two weeks. It's massive and the undertaking um, is, is intense. So we won't have results from that for a little while. Any other questions about design? Okay. Next is headlines. We've been doing some research on what makes headlines uh, work or not work. And one of the studies that we've done here is looking at clickbait headlines. And um, our examples here are included later on the slide. So a more traditional headline would be something like, rail stoppage is weeks away unless Congress acts soon. And a question-based version of this would be, is a rail stoppage weeks away unless Congress acts soon? Question mark. And in the studies that we've done looking at clickbait headlines, both in a lab setting and by looking at traffic data corresponding uh, to where people click on, we've done it on now nine different news sites by looking at where people click, so their traffic data compared to the headline used. What we find is that these question-based clickbait type headlines lead to more negative attitudes about the headline, negative expectations about the story, and fewer clicks. So our takeaway is that particularly for these hard news types of stories, like, about, like those about Congress, these headlines are not in the interest of news organizations. And we've tested this very carefully now across um, several different data sets. So that's our takeaway for that. Um, I'm going to switch to content. I'm actually just gonna go through the content one next. I want to make sure that I leave some time at the end for questions and I see we're almost to one. So let me keep going um, through this next section as well. Um, and then we can have a broader discussion afterward. So for content, we've partnered with the Solutions Journalism Network on a number of occasions. And if you're not familiar, the Solutions Journalism Network argues that a lot of journalism right now um, talks about problems. So problems facing a community or problems uh, nationally. And what they argue is that journalists also could talk about the solutions and bring the same journalistic edge to solutions. So evaluating whether solutions are working or are not working, but looking at solutions as an important component of reporting. And we partnered with them to do several tests. We've done tests both using an experimental kind of lab-based setting. And we've also done tests with them uh, live on news site with Huffington Post looking at how people respond to solutions journalism and have a number of takeaways from that. So first, readers of solutions journalism feel more informed and interested than those that read a comparable article that focuses not on the solution, but more on the problems. We've also found, so we um, A-B tested 50 different headlines in collaboration with the Huffington Post that led to a story that discussed both problems and solutions. And so what we A-B tested was the headline on the homepage, whether it emphasized the solution or the problem. And we tried to make the headline as comparable as possible, except for whether it emphasized the solution or the problem. Now, it wasn't the case that in every instance, the solution headline outperformed the problem headline in terms of the number of clicks. It was the case, though, that across all 50 headlines, there was a small but significant increase in the number of people that were looking at the article when it had a solution compared to when it had a problem. So what we take from this is that there is interest in the solution form of journalism and in promoting it as a solution form of journalism. Won't happen in every case, but across many cases, there's a benefit to using this sort of journalism. And then we've also done um, another recent project um, with the Chattanooga Times Free Press where 
we analyzed what happened after they released a solutions journalism based feature and we tracked public tweets that were geotagged um, in Chattanooga about the issue. They were looking at poverty. And we found that this one solutions journalism feature was able to uh, produce a notable uptick in how often the community was tweeting about poverty for three days after this feature uh, was put out there, which I think is pretty incredible. If you think about who's on Twitter, how much it takes to create a bump and that it lasted for three days, I think that's a pretty um, substantial finding of the potential effects of this form of journalism. And I think the method that we use to try to isolate it also is um, a helpful one for news organizations trying to demonstrate impact. Uh, we will be releasing, so you're getting another scoop here, we will be releasing a big research project. We looked at um, news coverage on nine different sites uh, and compared the, the substance of their election coverage at the non-presidential level to the traffic that each of those articles generated. And what we found, uh, we found a couple of things. So first, the amount of issue coverage, so how many issues were mentioned on average per article, declined as election day approached. And we think that this is perhaps a little worrisome because we know from public opinion research that the public tunes into elections only as you get very close to election day. But if the amount of issue coverage is going down right when people are tuning in, this is potentially a mismatch if really what news organizations want to do is inform people about the issues prior to the moment that they go to the ballot or that they go to uh, the, the voting booth uh, to submit their ballot. So we highlight this as a potential concern. We also found um, that coverage that focused on more issues or more strategy, and by strategy we mean this would be like poll results or who's ahead in the fundraising battle or this candidate is ahead and this one is behind. Think here about uh, horse race coverage, but instead of horses, you're talking about candidates. We found that articles that include either of those tended to receive fewer page views and social referrals than articles that didn't mention these aspects of the campaign, which is potentially worrisome because this really is the substance of a campaign is talking about the issues. Um, strategy coverage, some suggest that this sort of coverage increases people's political cynicism. So maybe we don't want to necessarily highlight that for the democratic purpose, but the issues one is disturbing. And because this worried us a little bit, we looked more deeply into what sort of issues are actually increasing the probability that people are looking at this sort of down ballot election coverage. And we found that news articles mentioning corruption or scandal actually earn more page views and social referrals. So we take from this that it's not just any issues or a lot of issues that really get people to look at this sort of election coverage. It's very targeted sorts of election coverage. Now, I don't think that corruption and scandal coverage are going to be the norm of the type of issue that work in every single election, but I think they did show some benefits in the 2016 election leading up to it. And I see we have a question here. I'm gonna to turn to this. Um, what's an example of campaign coverage that doesn't include issue and or strategy? Really excellent question. This would be something like a backgrounder, so something that's giving you detail, details about the biography of a particular candidate. So that wouldn't necessarily be an issue and it wouldn't necessarily be strategy coverage at all. And I should say that the way that we analyzed this was looking at the number of issues that are covered in the article. So those articles that covered fewer issues were earning more of these social referrals and page views than those that try to cover a lot of them. So there's also something here about volume and not necessarily the presence or absence of these things. So I hope that helps. Um, any other questions about headlines or content? Okay, I'm gonna plow forward again so that we have um, time for more general discussion that isn't related to any of these topics. Okay, so push alerts is our last one. We've been really interested in the mobile, uh, the mobile world and how people are engaging with the news on mobile. We did a research project looking at push alerts where we asked a random half of people to download an app and push alerts and the other half to download the app but not put on push alerts because we wanted to know what is the unique effect of installing push alerts. The first thing we found I don't think is terribly surprising. Those that install the apps and notifications or push alerts or whatever you want to call them, they use the app at a significantly higher rate than those that didn't have notifications. We would expect this to be the case. If this didn't happen, it would be weird, right? The push notification should drive more traffic to the app, and that's what we found. The second one, and whoever asked the age question moments ago, this one is also for you. The second one I found was so interesting, which is that older respondents said that they were more likely to keep the notifications on their phone after the story ended. 
And I was recently involved with a news organization that was thinking about some of these new technological innovations for news. And it was really interesting because in the news meetings, staff were saying, okay, let's think of our, let's think of the, an example of who the user is. And almost everyone was saying, it's the younger, it's the tech savvy person. I think this study shows that that should not be the default by any means. And when I brought this up, the newsroom was saying, oh, you know, maybe there is actually an older demographic that would find these technological innovations to be quite interesting. Um, so that was another thing we found. And looking at the democratic implications of this, notifications sometimes increased knowledge, but not always. And what I make of this is two things. One, I think that notifications don't always increase knowledge because for some notifications, literally everyone knows that information because the notifications tell you, you see it in any newspaper you pick up, you hear it on the television news, it's just ubiquitous. And I think that this indicates that there's one sort of user for notifications that they wanna hear it first. It's not that they're gonna get unique knowledge, but they know the knowledge first. So I think that's one use case for notifications. The second is that some of the sites that we worked with on for doing this research, and I should say we didn't collaborate with news organizations for this, we um, simply used their notification platform. They would send out push alerts that were unique. So it was a news organization that sent something out that no other news organization was doing. And I think this identifies a second use case for push alerts, which is finding these unique areas of interest for users that give them information that they wouldn't find elsewhere. So it's a uniqueness. One is a, I hear it fast and everyone knows it. The second one is it's a unique form of information. And I think that the increase that we've seen in tailoring of these push alerts, so giving people, here are the, all these different types of push alerts, you can pick which ones you'd most wanna tailor, is, is right on point with his second sort of use case, which is allowing people to know uh, particular types of news that might not be of interest to the general public. Okay, so summary statement here, in order to give us at least a little bit of time for general Q&A at the end, I'm just gonna leave it up here on the slide for you um, and go really quickly to say, journalists get involved, use respect, use quizzes, consider new uh, comment sections design and homepage layouts, don't use clickbait headlines, consider solutions journalism and think about making push notifications available. And with that, I will say, um, delighted to hear of your questions and comments and really receptive to following up with any of you if you're interested in hearing more details about any of this or if you have a research project of interest. And I'm now going to look over here. Um, we have not looked at push alerts, um, desktop browser um, versus app, but I love that idea. Um, I also think that the results might end up being similar. Um, it's also interesting when thinking about uh, push alerts on the different platforms because there are differences whether it's Android or iPhone, whether you're using um, whether you're using Chrome or Firefox or Safari, and so I think that that's also something to consider when we're thinking about desktop versus others. Um, if you've looked at interactive versus static home pages, and I'm assuming here that when you're thinking about interactive. I could think of that in a couple of different ways. If whoever wrote this comment wants to jump in um, and let us know what they mean exactly by interactive or static, because on one hand I could see it as interactive being a news organization that updates routinely and is always changing things, static being maybe one that they update in the morning and don't update anymore. I could also see this as being an interactive homepage including lots of things like quizzes or other things that you can participate in versus one that doesn't do that. Um, and we haven't looked at the former, which is how frequently a site is updating. Although I have a colleague um, at, uh, uh, I believe he's at uh, American University, but I may mis be misremembering his university, which is terrible, but um, his name is Matt Heinemann. And he's been looking at what sort of factors news organizations should really consider. And he, he suggests that continually updating the news website is incredibly important for keeping and developing a loyal audience. And other research suggests that interactive elements on a site, like things like a quiz tool or ways to get people involved, are a way to encourage uh, people to come back and to get them involved with your news brand. But neither of those are research that Engaging News Project has done. Those are, those are reports that I'm, I'm sharing that others have done. Oh, any research from EMP on paywalls? What a really uh, good question. We have not done research specifically looking at paywalls, um, but a research project that we're about to work on that if anyone is interested in, um, and I, I hope that we'll be uh, chatting with INN more about this, is looking at what messages news organizations share on social media to try to encourage people to become subscribers or members, or even something simple as liking the page. 
our intuition is that the messages that you use, the actual language used in these social media posts matter a lot. And we have some theories about what sorts of language will, will work better than others. And so we're going to be looking for news organizations that are interested in testing this. Um, so if you're interested in that, let me know. Uh, paywalls research, um, it's, uh, it, it's uh, if we do anything on that, I will make sure that we share it with, with uh, INN members. Uh, another good question from Ken Martin. Don't studies find that high percentage of traffic does not come to the homepage? This really varies by news site. So there are some news sites that still get a substantial chunk of traffic from their homepage. And for these organizations, they tend to think of that homepage audience as being really quite loyal. Um, there also has been some research looking at people's search behavior on Google. And interestingly, there is, there is, a, there is a, a portion of people that search for specific news organizations and then go to their homepage. So there's still some homepage traffic there. This is not the case for all news organizations, though, to be totally sure. This definitely varies by newsroom. So some news organizations are seeing a majority, if not most, of their traffic coming from search and social. So there, I think the question that um, another person asked about, how do you design the article page to encourage even one more click, becomes even more pertinent, and that's why we're looking at that as one of our next research projects. Additional thoughts and questions. I think we have a couple more minutes here. Uh, a great question here about research on newsletters. Um, we have not done any, uh, again, as the Engaging News Project, and so I can share anecdotes with you um, from organizations that have been experimenting with newsletters and finding great success at using newsletters uh, to get people to come to their site and to create a very loyal user base that's looking to your organization as a source for information. Some of the things that they've shared with us include one, that the timing of the newsletter has to be kept constant over time because people then develop a habit for using that news and information. A second thing that we recommend for anything that you're doing like that is invest in some sort of a newsletter software that lets you engage in A-B testing. Because for different audiences, the way in which they engage with that newsletter is going to be different. And determining whether a picture or not a picture is a good idea, whether four or eight headlines is a good idea, that may actually be different depending on different audiences. And if you have some good A-B software, you can do these systematic tests to find out what is working best for people as part of your audience. So that, those are things that we've heard and a best practice in terms of really finding out how to make the newsletter cater to your audience that I would share. Uh, what other recommendations do you have on headlines uh, based on research? So uh, in the academic world on headlines, I'm, I'm sad to share actually that there has not been tons and tons of research. So we really feel like we're doing, uh, we're doing some interesting things here. And the ways that we've analyzed it so far, I've shared with you. So one, we've done the solutions uh, versus the problem headlines with the slight benefit to solutions. And second, we've done this research where we're looking at these more clickbait types of headlines versus more traditional types of headlines, finding some negative impact for the clickbait ones. Um, we are eager to continue this sort of arena of research. So if you have particular things about headlines that are of interest to you, please share them with us. Uh, one other thing that I should mention that we did look at when we were looking at solutions and problems um, we did some research looking at different attributes of headlines. So for example, if you include the word you in a headline, does that increase the chances that people are going to click on it? We didn't find anything systematic with you. So it wasn't as though every time we included you, we saw an increase in clicks. The one part that we did find uh, a, 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 an increase in clicks that seemed to persist, at least in some of our trials, was when we were including, a we called it a mysterious entity, which in some ways has a little bit of a clickbait component to it, but we were varying whether the headline would say something like, um, uh, Chicago residents protest X, or do you say, um, one city's residents protest X. When you use that one city, people were more likely to click on it than if you said Chicago. And I think that that was in part because no matter where you live, you were still kind of interested in it. Whereas if you narrow the geographic focus to just Chicago, people were people who didn't live in Chicago then found a reason to not click on it. Um, I don't know that that would necessarily be the case though for a local news organization because there it might actually generate more clicks if you are including the name of the city. So I think we need more refinement on that. Um, the, my lesson that I learned from doing that study, we tested four different principles, you being one, mysterious entity being another one, 
and the others didn't really play out. So I think that there's a lot more to learn about headlines. We just need to think through exactly what things we want to test. Um, and if you have interest in that, again, I keep saying this, but I really am sincere. If you have interest in testing these sorts of things, um, of course, do it in your own newsroom. If you need a, a guidance on the side, like how would you set this up? Totally happy to have that conversation. Or if you'd actually like to work with engaging news project or would like recommendations for um, an academic organization near you that might do this, I'm happy to do all of those things. Um, I actually have 115 and I can't believe how quickly this um, went by, but it was probably because I was blabbing the whole time. But um, I am so happy to answer any additional questions as we move forward. And thank you all so much um, for, uh, for participating in this. It was really exciting to see the questions and comments. Brand, do we what what is our next step here? Is there anything more I can do? So thank you so much. I there was so much participation and interaction and questions. It was delightful and that's exactly what we hoped for. Um, the next steps will be that uh, Laura will send uh, will ask you to send us a, a copy of your slides Hi. and um, we will we will set we'll share that with the folks that registered for the webinar. Um, and additionally, the recording of the webinar will also be posted on YouTube, correct? Laura, Laura, you can speak to yeah, that, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll send out a, a YouTube recording. It'll be unlisted, so you, you know everyone will get the link and you just have to go for the link. You can't actually search for it. Um, I'm also gonna be sending out evaluations and uh, just to make a plug for those, we really, really need them um, we, in order to continue this series. Um, you get a chance to suggest future trainers or, or topics that you want to know about. Um, just please fill those out so we can demonstrate to funders that this is important to our membership. Um, and thanks so much to everyone who came and asked great questions. This was really great. Thanks again, Talia. It was outstanding. I learned a lot. <laughs> My tremendous pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you for the great questions. I'm delighted to follow up with anyone uh, who might be interested. Great. Thank you and take care.